The test is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1 You will hear part of a tutorial between two students and their tutor. The students are doing a research project to do with computer use. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Dr Barrett? Sammy, come in. Is Irene with you? Yes. Good. Sit down. Right, we're looking at how far you've got with your research project since we last met. You decided to do a survey about computer facilities at the university, didn't you? That's right. We decided to investigate the university's open access centres and, in particular, the computer facilities. Lots of the students are having trouble getting access to a computer when they need one, so we thought it would be a useful area to research. Good, fine. It's not a topic anyone has looked at before, as far as I know, so it's a good choice. So, what background reading did you do? Well, we looked in the catalogues in the library, but we couldn't find much that was useful. It's such a specialised subject, hardly anything seems to have been published about it. And as well as that, the technology is all changing so quickly. But the Open Access Centre has an online questionnaire on computer use that it asks all the students to do at the end of their first year. And the supervisor gave us access to that data, so we used it as a starting point for our research. It wasn't exactly what we needed, but it gave us an idea of what we wanted to find out in our survey. Then we designed our own questionnaire. And how did you use it? We approached students individually and went through our questionnaire with them on a one-to-one -one basis. So you actually asked them the questions? That's right. We made notes of the answers as we went along and... Actually, we found we got a bit of extra information that way as well about the underlying attitudes of the people we were interviewing by observing the body language and things like that. How big was your sample? Well, altogether, we interviewed a random sample of 65 students, 55% male and 45% female. And what about the locations and times of the survey? We went to the five open access computer centres at the university and we got about equal amounts of data at each one. It took us three weeks. We did it during the week, in the day and in the evenings. Not the weekends? No. So presumably your respondents were mostly full-time students? Yes. Oh, you mean we should have collected some data at the weekends from the part-time students? We didn't think of that. OK, it's just an example of how difficult it is to get a truly random sample. So, how far have you got with the analysis of results? Well, everyone agreed there was a problem, but we're more interested in what they think should be done about it. The most popular suggestion was for some sort of booking system. About 77% of the students thought that would be best, but there were other suggestions. For example, about 65% of people thought it would help if the opening hours were longer, like 24 hours a day. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. 
So, what other suggestions did people come up with? Well, actually, the main reason why people can't get to a computer is because so many students are using them for personal emails or just surfing the web. So, one solution would be to have some computer rooms for recreational use, and some for people to do serious work in. The trouble is. Quite often, people do their work. Then they want to check their emails, and it would be a nuisance if you had to get up and go to another room and log on again just for that. Another problem is that during the day, tutors book whole blocks of computers for complete sessions. So several people said there should be restrictions on block bookings, but the trouble is the classes need the computers. There's nothing else they can use. Some people said the whole problem would be solved if the university would just buy more computers, but other people said it might make things better for a bit, but it wouldn't really solve the problem permanently. You can't just solve the problem by throwing money at it. And with the suggestion that the computer room should stay open round the clock, some people did point out that there'd have to be someone around all the time to make sure the equipment didn't get stolen, especially at night. So a booking system seems to be the best suggestion. Yes, apparently some universities have a sort of queuing system. It means the staff at the open access centres have to organise it, but people say it works quite well. You go along, and if there isn't a computer free just then, you're given a numbered ticket, and then when your number is called out, you have the next available computer. Or it can be done electronically as well, but that's more complicated, and it isn't really necessary. Good. So now let's discuss. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear an accommodation officer telling students about different halls of residence. You now have thirty seconds to read questions eleven to fifteen. Good afternoon, and welcome to Stanton University. I'm here to tell you about the various halls of residence we have available, should you choose to come here. We aim to offer accommodation in halls to all first-year students, and you'll find there's a good variety to choose from. First of all, there's Brown Hall, which, as you'll see, is not the most modern of buildings, but it is very popular with some students. It's got a good sense of community, some nice refurbished kitchens, and unlike the other halls, it has recently had a gym built in its basement. Another option is Blake Residence, which is built like a large house, and so everybody cooks and eats together. It has its own sectioned-off bit of private garden, and is even more peaceful because this is an all-girls residence. Although, of course, boys are allowed to visit the hall, and、uh, I understand frequently take part in cooking dinner. 
The largest hall we have is Queen's Building, and this has been upgraded recently. The original parking area has been built on so that the hall now has a large common room, and each bedroom now has its own shower room, which many students regard as a real bonus. A further option is the Parkway Flats, which won an award for design in its day. And this building now has a preservation order on it. This has meant that only a limited amount could be done to upgrade it, and the surrounding area is important, so parking is not permitted around the flats. However, the flats do have many extra facilities, such as a special computer room, a small library, and a self-service restaurant. The cost of breakfast, lunch, and dinner is covered in the fees for this hall, so it does look a bit more expensive. The last residence we can offer you is Temple Rise, which again is slightly more expensive than other halls as the rooms are larger. This has got very lovely views across to the coast, and this more than compensates for the fact that bathrooms here are shared between six students. However, the hall has domestic staff who clean the rooms once a week, so this is perhaps an attractive option for the messier amongst you. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 16 to 20. Now, if I can just show on this wall map here where they all are, uh, you might like to go and have a look round. If you come into the main university entrance, at the first junction, you'll find that Brown Hall is on the corner opposite the theatre. So you're nice and near the station here, though I think it can get a bit noisy with traffic. The same applies to Blake Residence, which is directly facing the junction to the university entrance. These halls are often used by medical students and such like, as they're out all day, so don't notice the noise. Anyway, if you then walk along Campus Road towards the main circle, you'll see the library on the corner, and Queen's Building is just past that as you head north. You will find that it is quieter here, and you may get fewer visitors. By the way, the circle is quite a feature of the campus, as it's set into the hills and has a brand new sports centre in the middle. It's worth going to look around it. Now, the Parkway Flats are on the opposite corner to the library, facing the circle, as you head towards the main buildings. The main buildings are only about a five-minute walk from here, and places in these halls go quickly, so my advice is to reserve your place as soon as possible. Then, Temple Rise is inside the circle, next to the sports centre, but further from the main university buildings. Now, if you'd like to go off and physically... That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. 
Part 3 You will hear two business studies students discussing a presentation they'll do on an article on working effectively in groups. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen and answer questions 21 to 26. So, Brad, what did you think of the article on group work? Oh, hi, Helen. Uh, yeah, it was pretty good, with helpful pieces of advice on how to make group work effective. I think we were lucky to be given such a straightforward text to present at the Management Skills Seminar. Yeah. Actually, shall we discuss it now? Have you got time? Sure. It's only a 10-minute presentation, so we just need to explain and then give our views on the main points raised in the article. I'll jot down some notes. Right. So, there are three main sections. I suggest we start with listening. Yeah, effective listening in groups, because it's not something that's frequently covered on courses in our field. No, and we should say that in the presentation. Yeah. And also, effective listening's pretty simple, you know. I don't think it's hard to learn. Well, people think it's easy, but in my experience, most of us tend to be very lazy listeners. OK, I wouldn't argue with that. <laughs> <laughs> Something I do think we should emphasize is the power of the listener's posture, gestures, etc., in making speakers feel respected. Not that you're just waiting for them to finish before jumping in with your own ideas. Uh huh. OK, right. Uh, the next section is on goal setting. Let's make sure we're clear what the article says on this. Yeah. Well, firstly, it says that all group members must be given time to explain their own goals. That's it, yeah. And then did it say that the whole group should agree on common goals? That's a bit too strong. It's more that everyone's agendas should be equally acceptable. But it does say that goals have to be realistic, you know... Achievable within a particular time? You've got it. That's really what the article's saying. There isn't really any point in having ideals if group members know they won't come to anything within a reasonable period. So, I think a summary covering those points will be enough for that part of the presentation, don't you? Yep. Yeah. Now, the last section is about conflict resolution. Actually, I thought it was the worst part of the article. Me too. I don't think it went into sufficient detail on the issue. Actually, I thought it devoted too much space to it, but that it was all rather boring, you know? It didn't mention some of the more radical theories. Absolutely. I found that really irritating. Right. And also, I think it could have said more about conflict sometimes being healthy in groups. Absolutely. It just mentioned rather glibly about how we should avoid thinking of winners and losers and that quick resolution of conflict is always desirable. Without explaining what these terms mean? Well, it gives quite detailed definitions, but doesn't develop a proper argument. Right. So for the presentation, I think we just give some definitions and... And then explain what we felt were the weaknesses in the article's treatment of conflict resolution. Yeah, good. Now you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. So, let's think about what we have to prepare for the actual presentation. Well, I suppose we'll use PowerPoint, but I'm hopeless at using it, especially if it has any visuals. I really have to look into doing a course on it because I know I'll need it in the future. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm quite happy using PowerPoint and I'll put it together when everything else is ready. That's a relief. 
But yes, do that later. Okay. Now, I heard the tutor saying we have to include some well-chosen quotations from the article. I'm not sure if we do. I'll email him to find out. No need. I can just have a look at the specs he gave us when he set the task. That'll be quicker. But the tutor definitely said we have to prepare a handout to go with the talk. I'm not really sure how we do that. Sarah did one last year. Who's she? She's doing the same option as me on marketing. I'll ask her advice on what to include. Great. So that just leaves the bibliography at the end. I suppose it'll mainly be articles. Yeah. So we'll just look on the web, and we can leave that till later. But we've been advised against that. Well, we could have a look through some journals in the library. I think we should start by looking through module handbooks. I think that'll give us some good leads. Yeah, you're probably right. So that's all the topics. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a news broadcast about proposed developments in a local area and about a local college. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. And now for our main headlines on Southern Local News for today. First of all, the report relating to the proposed motorway and other developments around the village of Tartlesbury was published this morning. And, as has been expected, it has created quite a lot of interest. The new motorway will pass along the north side of the village, crossing the River Team less than half a kilometre from the well-known beauty spot, Streve Ford, to the northeast of the village. The motorway will cut the village off from the Ford, where many children play. But that is not the end of it. There are also plans to build a thousand houses on farmland west of the village. And on top of that, there are proposals to build an industrial estate for new technology companies on the site of the old steelworks on the edge of the village. A new centre with a swimming pool and a very wide range of sports facilities and a large supermarket with other shops are also planned next to the housing estate. Mr Jones, a local farmer we spoke to early today, is strongly against the plans. But the local council is pushing for them to be adopted in full. They say that new housing is needed in the area and that it is an opportunity to take advantage of government grants for setting up new technology developments. The mayor, Mr Fun, says... We must make every effort to do our part for the economy of the country and for the local people. This is a golden opportunity to put Tartlesbury on the map. Reactions to Mr Fun's comments have been quick to come. Surprisingly, when we contacted the spokesman of the local conservation group, he was very much for the planned developments. But not all the local groups support the scheme. And, unlike the mayor, the local MP, Mrs Wright, 
is very much against the planned developments. Mr. Khan, a local shopkeeper, had this to say: "People are absolutely horrified at what is being proposed here. This is just a chance for some people to make money quickly. But I can assure you that if they think that local people are going to be a walkover, they have another think coming. Of course, we welcome the jobs that the new technology park will bring, but we feel that the large increase in housing and the proposed motorway." Will destroy the character of the area. I think this is a debate that is going to run on for quite some time, and we here on local news will keep you informed. And now for something quite different. This year's exam results have just come out, and there are a lot of happy faces out there. It would seem that the number of young people going on to university from the local college in Upton, which is not far from Tartlesbury, has increased by twenty-five percent this year. All those who have applied to go to university or into teacher training colleges have found places. This is the first time that there has been a one hundred percent success rate at the college. We spoke earlier to the principal of the college, who said she was very proud of all those who had achieved their aims, and she wished them every success in the future. There will be another news bulletin at eleven p.m., and for now, it's back to more music from around the world. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the test. You now have ten minutes to transfer your answers to your IELTS Listening Answer Sheet. <laughs>